Okay, so we got Jason Ho over here. Um, Jason Ho is also from the class of 2017, was my classmate back then. And the reason I brought him on is that he's a genetics PhD student at Yale University. And that program has a, an acceptance rate of 10%. And the impressive thing about that is that Jason is an international student. That means that the stipend for his PhD program was paid out of the school's bank account instead of um government funding. Because like for um um US passport students like um like 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 um the government actually pay for the programs. So like um the university has to be really selective with who they accept for international students because they are paying the students themselves. All right, so let's get started. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing pretty well this morning. How about you, Jeremy? How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty not bad. Um, Sunday evening, about to work tomorrow. Yeah. Yo, so, same way. Have to work tomorrow too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, give us a brief introduction of um your KS career. So uh, what clubs you joined? What activities were you involved in? And um, specifically um, what did you do in KS that you feel like that have a that benefit to you like really powerfully later on in life? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's been a while. So this question is definitely taking me down memory lane. And now I start broad and then start narrowing down to what I think benefit most um, in regard to my current position. Um, I think I didn't do anything that is um, particularly science really oriented or related. Um, but I would say I was more of an ordinary student in the whole student body. And regarding my um, extracurriculums, I was a co-president of Casper, the school newspaper club. I was a member of the Model UN. I was also part of Red Cross, Router, and other um, volunteering groups. The only in-school achievement I, I can think of was getting the Chinese Excellency Award in my senior year, but that was kind of fine because it has nothing to do with science, but I still consider that as one of my own high school achievements. I'm proud of it. And back to, I think what the question is really getting at is um, anything science related. Um, to your surprise, I didn't join any um, science clubs or science Olympics. I think the most science thing I did in high school was probably doing experiments for extended essays, EEs, or internal assessments, IAs for IB diploma, and also all the biology and chemistry labs courses. Um, also the big science projects in our senior year, um, during which the whole class could participate and divide into four to six teams, I remember. But I forgot the name of a big project. Um, I only remember it was really fun and everyone's it was really engaging and i learned a lot like in terms of teamwork and then designing experiments from from the ground up but yeah back to a question um, in hindsight i did not do much that is highly relevant to what i'm doing now or what i majored in college however back in college uh, uh, sorry back in high school mm. i did I, I did know that i like science either chemistry or biology so i think that's why i wanted to explore something else like writing or journalism so I joined Casper in addition to my already known passion. So high school for me was more of just going with the flow and play around things to see how they would turn out while maintaining a decent or okay grade at the same time. Yeah, you got yeah. great grade. Remember, <laughs> but but like I remember <laughs> we didn't join any um biology club or like chemistry club, but like um you were like so we had this like for um biology IB class we have to like have like the teacher send out study guides and and like um Jason used to make his own version of the study guide and send it to everybody in class and that actually bumped our grades up so much because it was so informative and was so organized and it's amazing thanks Jason by the way <laughs> uh, I'm happy that helped you so much I mean at first um when Mr. Russell and all the study guide I was just going to answer questions myself but when people start asking like do you want to make a group study guide and I, I will tell them that Oh, I already made. I already answered questions myself. Do you want me to just share a document with you? And then slowly it turns out to like sharing with the whole class. Yeah. And I guess I'm just happy like everyone can get 
A or a high grade in that class and doesn't have to study much. So sorry, Mr. Ra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, like yeah. also surprised because when you share the document with me, I, I press the share button to see who was in it. There were like 50, 60 people in the same study guide, <laughs> in the same Google Doc. I was like, <laughs> man, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good memory. But Okay, let's go back to the next question. So, um, so um, genetics PhD, like, um, what exactly are you focused on in your um studies with the with this program? Okay, so um, actually, before I answer this question or any questions that related to genetics or PhD career, <clears throat> I just want to say I'm just a second year PhD student which means I'm at an early stage of my career and really naive in the field. So please, um, for the audience, please take my answers with a grain of salt. If someone more experienced is listening to this interview and find something I said to be incorrect or incomplete, please do correct me or just comment anyways. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll just start with answering the question. Oh, chill. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the first comment I'll make about this question of what does the genetics PhD focus on is um I like how this question is phrased. So instead of asking what a genetics PhD student do, this specific asks what a PhD student focus on. So I basically kind of prevents me from renting all the obligations we have as PhD students. But um jokes aside, I think I'm going to start broad with what are the types of topics the geneticists will be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Then I'll narrow down to what a genetics PhD student could contribute to this bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And then specifically uh, what I do in lab. So I think needless to say, geneticists care about genes. We, we care about the central dogma from DNA to RNA to protein. We, we care about how the vast amount of biomolecules interact with one another. Um, <clears throat> during this process of carrying out a certain gene expression that's either conducive or detrimental to an organism. So underneath that um, umbrella, big um, umbrella term genetics, there are many subfields. For, for, um, for, in, for instance, in epigenetics, we look at modifications that can alter gene expression by not directly uh, changing the DNA or RNA sequence. And in genomics, instead of looking at gene gene-to-gene -gene interactions, people focus on like more the regions of DNA or the 3D architecture of a genome or even the evolution of the genome. And the list of the subfields in genetics can go on and on, including um, <clears throat> including that tensor genetics, um, developmental genetics and population genetics, anything. So that's a bigger picture. There are many branches in genetics. And as a genetics PhD student, you are not studying everything, right? I mean. No one in the field can do that. For sure, you can dabble in multiple fields, but when it comes to specialty, usually we are talking about one or two. Mm. For me, my current lab and my current projects are um, mostly focused on developmental genetics and epigenetics, or sometimes we call it epigenome. I chose this lab and these projects because I find developmental genetics fascinating. This field primarily studies how an organism devolves from a single cell zygote to an embryo um, and then eventually to an adult. And my study specifically looks at early mammalian embryogenesis, basically the first week of embryonic development. Um, back to the main question. A genetic student, genetic PhD student do the experiment. As simple as it sounds, it can be demanding at times, depending on the experiments you are tasked with. But yes, most or even all experiments you see in publications are done by PhD students, um, postdocs or master's students. Mm -hmm. Your PI or professor are who are in charge of a lab usually do not do the experiments themselves, but there are also exceptions. Like junior PIs or professors that just started who just started their labs will do experiments and train students themselves. But as the time goes on and the lab becomes more mature, PIs generally step down and stop doing all the lab work. Mm -hmm. And Another cool thing that a PhD student will do in lab is that, um, is that the experiments you do are not limited by the field you're in. For example, I'm a genetic genetics PhD student, but I might have to do a biochemistry assay in addition to a regular um, molecular assays in, in my realm. Hmm. So 
I think in brief, a genetics PhD student or just a PhD student in general finds ways, like, um, either traditional or creative ways to answer their research questions. You're in charge of executing, troubleshooting those plans just to gather the evidence um, you need for a hopefully solid and convincing answer to your research questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, I found that actually really interesting because like when we think about um, genes, like like we didn't, mm -hmm. I never thought that it's going to go into so many different topics and actually different researchers focus on like so many different like specific topics. And um, I also realized that that's the, um, that's the, um, that's the condition for um, every job, actually. I just started working as a um, um, internet service consultant. And I realized that, like, um, you can actually be a consultant, you can be a developer, you can be a project manager, and, like, all, all those different jobs within a a a service service or a study that seems so, um, so general and so simple. But actually, it can be broken down into so many different subtopics. Yeah. So, and um, actually, I had I just had a really like um a question that I'm actually really curious about. So you mentioned that mm -hmm. your study also focused on epigenetics. I remember that from Mr. Mm -hmm. IV class. Like, I think it's about like um how like your mind, your mindsets can turn on and off the different genes your in your body, and like um so like that may like leads to like positive positive thinking like um giving you a better body and better genes to for success and health is that is that what it's about like i'm curious like yeah good question um so i hmm, i haven't read much about how the mindsets would change the epigenome in brain or in neural networks but um i think there are studies on that but they specifically use use drugs to test how those effects would change the epigenetic um, regulations in your brain and how that would indirectly affect your mental state. <clears throat> but I think you're right in terms of like um, how you think can affect your physiolo physiology. But I just cannot think of a solid evidence from a paper right now. Mm. I see. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. 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 All right. So, um, so, um, I guess this question, um, leads to more specific things that we just talked about. So, um, what are some of the researchers that have, you have been on and what role did you play in it? Mm. So compared to many of my colleagues, I'm exposed to a less variety of research, to be honest. Um, Many of my colleagues, the, even though they're in genetics uh, department, they come in from like, different backgrounds. Some people study cancer before, some have some some people study um, microbiology before, and some people study like computational analysis or something, not really directly related to genetics. But for me, um, during my first, I I think most of my research started in college. I didn't do much research uh, when I was in high school. And so during my freshman year summer in college, I had an internship at Academia Seneca, Zhongyan Yuan at Taiwan. And during that internship, I was not given a project, but just assisting a lab tech in maintaining and passaging cell cultures. It's really basic work. I mean, I was just a freshman back then. So um, the PH really couldn't give me too much to work on. <laughs> he probably also doesn't trust me at that point. Then at the beginning of my sophomore year, I joined the Zeng lab at Wake Forest, where I went for undergrad. And um, by the way, I like Wake Forest and highly recommend there. Um, great environment, great school, and awesome people there. Um, so when I first joined the lab, I could only attend the weekly lab meeting, lab meetings, and couldn't do any wild lab work. I started actually working, doing lab work in my second semester um, in the lab. And my projects in the Zen lab were all around epigenetic modulations on histone 3. I think my resume has some bullet points in that regard, so I will not go over them in detail unless you want to, but let me know if anyone has further questions and they can probably email me or something. And going on as an undergrad research um, assistant in the lab, I was given, finally, I was given my own projects and a PhD mentor whom I could go to whenever I had questions. 
even though I have and even though I have my own projects as an undergrad working in the research lab, I didn't have much independence due to the lack of knowledge and skill set. So oftentimes I will I would have to consult with my PhD mentor in terms of experimental design and understanding the protocols. I would also discuss research directions with my PI. And that I think that that experience was really conducive. That environment is also really conducive because my PI is just my PI's office is just down the hall and my mentor just sitting next What's to me. PI? Yes. Hmm? What's a PI? Oh, <laughs> sorry. So PI is short for sorry. I just this is the joke jargon that we use every day. I just <laughs> thought that everyone would know. Sorry, it's my bad. Oh, um, PI is short for project investigator. Usually that's the term that usually appears on grant. And usually the name that would be on the PI box would be the the person the, or the person with the professor in charge of the lab. Mm. So um, as the time passed on, people just, we just refer to the professor in charge of the lab as your PI, like your boss yeah, mm. of the lab. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, my PI and my mentor was really helpful, really supportive when I was doing experiments and when like when I was in, was in Confucian, which happens a lot. <laughs> And, but fortunately, my work in the lab led to two publications, one published during the spring of my junior, um, of my junior year, yes, and the other was published last year. And just to clarify, I'm not the, I'm not the first author in either of these papers. In fact, in biology, it's very rare for undergrad to be the first author on a publication, since each paper requires a lot of experiments. And some of them are <clears throat> out of the cap cap capability of undergrad. So... Don't be stressed out if you're a bio major in college and do not have a first author publication because it should be like that in most scenarios. Mm -hmm. And even getting your name on publication sounds as an undergrad is rare. But I think I was really lucky that my experiments worked and were at a decent quality to be included in the paper. So after graduating from Wake, I came to Yale for my PhD training. Um, and after doing the required three lab rotations, Everyone in my cohort picked a lab to join, and I joined the Smith lab, which is my current lab. And as I mentioned earlier, our lab is interested in mammalian development and the genetics, epigenetics supporting that process. Uh, what's my three mammalian? Hmm? What's a mammalian de development? Is that how it's pronounced? What is that? Yeah, I just call, yeah. So, um, there are people who will, who will use different organisms. Um, like different species to study development. Mm -hmm. For example, one very really common um, or, um, animal model is zebrafish, right? But uh, in zebrafish, the benefit of using zebrafish as a, as a model is that they their, their life cycle is really fast. So actually you can observe the developmental um, progress like within a day and you can see a dramatic change from a single cycle to an a most um a really well formed, well established embryo. Um, but what you but what you found in zebrafish, um, sometimes can be hard to carry on to human, because essentially we're two different species. Mm -hmm. So another battle model would be using um something like a mouse, right? A mammalian model. So that's why we why um people in the lab will usually say we study mammalian development to make it more specific that we use a mammalian model to study development oh. so that our findings can be like more related to human physiology. Yes. Oh. Also, there's another model, um, food flies. Food flies also a great model to study development. Oh. Um, cool. Hope that answered your question about why I said mammalian development. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought mammalian. Oh, mammal. Okay. I guess mammals, mammal, yeah, mammals, yeah, oh, yeah. So what's like what's the yeah. topic for that mammal, mammalian research, exactly? Yeah, so our lab, um, so in for mammals, it's really interesting because um, there actually there are two types of mammals, right? One with the one that that wait, let me backtrack this. Yes. I think, wait, wait, sorry, let me, let me backtrack this. No so 
different species have different developmental trajectories and different developmental stages to go through. For example, in fruit flies, they have to go through the larval stage, larval stage, mm. and to be adult. We don't. We <laughs> we develop in the womb. We we the the uh, mothers will have um, placenta that is part of the maternal environment to support the growth of the embryo. Mm. And then when the embryo is mostly developed, then it will come out of the womb, right? Basically, the mother will be giving birth to the baby. Mm. And this is also very different from reptiles, which they usually have eggs, and then the embryo will develop in the egg, or chicken pills develop in the egg. So what's really cool about memo is that the process is very complicated because you have to establish that maternal in uh, maternal environment in the mother's body mm. while developing the embryo and how these two um, kind of um, groups of cells because the placenta the placenta is not is also like developing together with the zygote mm. so how many people would think that oh probably um, placenta or the extra embryonic um, cells are from the mother originally but that is not totally correct because when a single, because both the placenta cells and the embryo cells are from the single zygote. Mm. So that's really interesting how the single zygote can divide into two different, dramatically different cell types. And that is one of my, one of, um, that is the focus of one of my projects. So yeah, that's my project three, which focus on the, um, differentiation of the of, of cells going to these two populations. Oh well, yes. I, I understood um sixty percent of that, but I think it's good enough. <laughs> yeah, I I I think it's my bad in terms of in, explaining these things in layman terms. I still have a lot of practice to do in terms of. Oh, you you explained it really yeah, well. Ex I just, I no, no, I, 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 I passed. I got a D, so it's good. It's good. I passed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways um all right yeah that's awesome that's that sound like a really informative research so um so you you just told me uh why you what researchers you were on and like the process of you um research the process of your research experience started from your undergrad to um phd so um so walk me through your typical day-to-day -day life right now. So what time do you go to school? What time you go to classes? Or what time you head to the lab? What's your day-to-day -day life life like? Mm. Yeah, so um, in terms of classes at my institute, most um, PhD students, most students in genetics actually finish um, their class requirements in the first two years. And so in our first years, in total, we'll take six classes. And then in our second year, which I'm now, we'll usually just take one, one class per semester. And that's not even a class. That's more of a seminar. So basically, people present their research or present paper. That's it. So um, and the bulk of a PhD is not about classes, but most of, more about research. So after your second year, unless you want to, typically, people don't take classes anymore. But we do TA, so we teach classes. Um, and back to a question of my day-to-day -day schedule, which is, I think uh, it's largely dependent on by the pro dependent on the protocol I'm running that day. So a day can be really short. Like I can I can be done with everything and leave the lab at like four or five, mm -hmm. or really long, like staying in lab until midnight, or sometimes I have to go to lab after midnight. In general, I just do experiments in lab. And when I'm not doing experiments, I'll run some computational analysis on the data I have, or I'll just read something interesting um, pertaining to my field. Mm. One unique technique in my lab that would uh, largely affect everyone's schedule is called the intracytoplasmic sperm injection, short, short for ITC, ICSI. So different from IVF, the in vitro fertilization, which is a common technique for for some um, couples who have difficulty in having babies, um, in, in vitro fertilization relies on the sperms themselves to swim toward the eggs for fertilization. But the technique we use in lab, um, it's the ICSI, we directly inject the sperm into the egg 
And so, but, but also due to the timing of the mouse development, <clears throat> that technique has to happen early in the morning. So if my schedule that day includes doing the sperm injection, I'll have to do go to lab um, really early in the morning. Mm. And also I'm TA, I'm a TA for undergrad um, bio class this semester. So that means my schedule will include, um, lead, my daily schedule will also include leading discussion, grading assignments and exams, things mm. like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, now I kind of got the idea of how my like TAs um, have their day-to-day -day life back in college. <laughs> yeah. But like, they, yeah. they, may, they may look really exhausted yeah. or tired, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's another really interesting um, um, experiment that you just shared. And um, yeah, I think that's going to help a lot of like um, couples and like, um, like yeah. med medical field in the future. And that kind of reminded me of a <laughs> experiment we did back in IB Biology. Yeah. <laughs> I hope Mr. Roth is not listening to this interview because yeah. <laughs> he'll probably be so on, mad. Well, not the of the, uh, <laughs> of the, of the research was, but I think it was an independent project. But, anyways. Yeah. Uh, um, it was okay. all for science. I will just yeah, all for science. That way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I see that we only have four minutes left in our. Um, let me let me close up the Zoom and open up another one to continue our conversation. All right. Sure. Sure. Okay, and we are back. And um, let me just double check on what the next question is. Oh yeah, so like um, so yeah, you've been a really long, um, you've been my friend since high school. So I, I know that when you first entered college, you wanted to attend medical medical school and become a doctor. So why did that change to becoming a researcher? So um, this is going to be a lengthy answer. Um, so if if anyone's not interested in this, can just skip this part. Um, but there are many, actually many reasons that went to this decision making, and I'll try my best to go through each of them and unfold my thought process two or three years ago when I made the decision. So the first and primary reason is a very pragmatic one in my opinion, which is med school acceptance rate in the, in the States for international students is super low, mm -hmm. much lower than getting into a grad program. And yes, there are international students who can get into med schools. And as a matter of fact, one of my friends from college did it. Um, I guess now I will just briefly share his story with you all mm -hmm. and then tie that back to my reasoning of why I decided not to apply to med school. So first of all, this friend of mine, he's an international student from China and he's brilliant, has stunning grades in college. Like he could ace almost all, all the tests we had. Um, we also used to be lab partners in both biochemistry and molecular bio labs. For every lab session, we're, our group is always the, was always the first group to finish everything and able to leave the lab, um, yeah, leave the lab at least an hour or two hours before all the other groups because some of the techniques can be baffling if you don't have some relevant research experience. And in addition to his excellency in, in classworks, he was also part of a school EMT team. EMT or EMS, I forgot. But basically he had an EM, I think EMS or EMT license or something like that. He also did research at Wake Meds, Wake's Med School. After college, he took a gap year to work uh, in a hospital but I forgot the exact position he was in. Anyways, he got a medicine-related job in his gap year and got into a med school after the gap year. So without a surprise, his MCAT score was high, not to mention his close to a 4.0 GPA in college and the impressive resume he had. The point of this is that, yes, he got into a med school, even though it's not a known one, but it's still a med school. And that's all that matters in the, at the end of the day, especially going through the extremely strenuous application preparation process. A med school is a med school. But if he were a domestic student, his credential, uh, his credentials could definitely like, get him into a highly prestigious program, like even an Ivy League med school. Many of my friends from college are in med school now, and not a lot of them have better credentials than this guy I'm talking about. 
However, since they are more, they are domestic students, it is relatively easier for them to get into better med school or just any med school. And sadly, this is the truth for international students in which we are subject to a smaller acceptance pool. I'm not discouraging anyone to not pursue this path. I'm just saying that you have to recognize that this is a challenging and frustrating one. You have to be mentally prepared for a lot of roadblocks. You might be able to get it if you're like him, really dedicated, really focused on studying. But there is also a chance that you won't get it. So I guess do your best and even go beyond that to secure a spot as an international student in med school. And to be honest, I believe he'll do great things with his ability and climb his way up because he always strives for excellency and never compromise with something less. But back to myself, I used to, I used to also, like, like Jeremy said, I should also be on the pre-med track, but I slowly realized how narrow the door is after attending multiple info sessions, um, talks, panels, just talking to seniors and international students. And again, you can completely disagree with me here, but I just feel like it's not worth my time and effort to pursue something that I have so little control over. So I forewent this path when I was sophomore. Again, you have you may have a dissimilar philosophy when making decisions like this. And I respect that, but I'm just simply sharing my experience here. Mm. And um, anyways, that leads to my second reason why I picked research over being a physician. So starting my sophomore year, uh, I became more and more involved in research. And lab, lab work was honestly my pr first priority um, during my sophomore and junior years. Like I would still be doing experiments till the last second before an exam or something because I enjoy, um, even though I enjoy most of my classes, no offense to a professor who taught me <laughs> all my classes, but I learned more from doing experiments and analyzing the results. So classworks and assignments belong to my second priority. And then they descend to my last part in my senior year because I simply want to spend more time with my friends because it's last year of college. Um, but back to the second year of my college, and initially I didn't know that I would like, if I like research or not, I sort of just joined the lab because many people in, in the state majors were doing this. So I guess peer pressure pushed me a little bit over there. And then I realized I'm doing research or studying something no one has fully explored yet is pretty cool, in my opinion. It's pretty cool. So at first, it's more like, okay, I'm exploring some an unknown territory. I feel lost, but it also gave me an opportunity to brainstorm ideas and test those ideas out. Then as I become more um, involved in the field, curiosity took over as a major motivation. I started to notice that I would be baffled or annoyed by when something isn't explained clearly in the textbooks or in papers. And I will start digging into those things and find out, try to find the answer. What's really fascinating about research is that in school, you, um, you rely on textbooks to obtain knowledge, even in med school. But research is the one providing text with those content. For, um, yeah, providing text with those content. The base so, the the um the exploration of um unknown territories and finding out different facts so that's where the textbooks information are based from basically is yeah exactly like for me that like research is a path of like discovering new things and i like new things so these are the moments that gave me the ideas of oh maybe i can continue continue doing research and then possibly turn this into a career um, the last major reason why I eventually picked research over med school is because I see more, um, I see more potentials and opportunities to improve medicine as a researcher. That's just a personal exp um, opinion here. Um, well, it's important to have a group of professionals that understand human physiology super well. It is equally critical to have a group of scientists who can support or provide new tools for physicians to tackle the disease. And so take COVID as an example. If the Weizmann lab at UPenn didn't figure out how to use the lipid nanoparticles to package modified mRNAs to make the now widely known and used mRNA vaccines, we might be in a much worse um, situation now with coronavirus still rampaging. Um, 
so yeah, in my opinion, like research has a has an indispensable value in terms of improving the quality of life, not only for patients, but also um, for the general public. And yet I think those are the three major reasons why I chose one path over the other. Yes. That was an amazing answer. <laughs> Thank you. First, you gave something practical. Like it's yeah. it's hard to hear and it's a, a little unfair because like, but it's the truth, like um, especially in the uh, medical school field and the um, science field, like um, if you have a US passport, it's a lot harder to get into a medical school. But at the same time, like um, it sounds like you really found your passion. Like like the the process really described like how you slowly got into researches and like um actually um figure out that it's really interesting to be exploring something that nobody has been exploring before. Yeah, that's amazing. That's one of the main reasons why I created this um interview series because like I want to see what different people's processes are from discovering your passion. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's great. Wow. Yeah, I wish I wish um, we had this back in the days. I mean, not back in that when we were in high school. I yeah. should say that. Yeah. The old yeah. man, old. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to make this sound too old because we're just like still in our twenties, so like, really young. So still twenty four. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's save that talk until we're like forty or something. But anyways, um. Yes, yes, yes. Let's say that. Um. Yeah, so um so um so I already mentioned how like it's really um colleges are really selective for like um students with a US passport in the um science field. So like um what do you think um made you exceptional and got the acceptance from Yale University? All right, um I'm not sure if I live up to that statement for being exceptional. I'll say I'm fortunate. I think that's the only ad adjective I would use. Um, but to answer, I really want to say I don't know. I'm I'm hundred percent sure that there were many more qualified applicants out there, and I'm not sure why I got so lucky to be accepted to a, to so many programs. Uh, <clears throat> it is true that the PhD acceptance rate for internationals is low, <clears throat> but it's not low though. Like at school. It's still doable. <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry. To my knowledge, for most PhD admission, international students are in a different pool, like separated from domestic students, because the course cannot pay us with federal grants, like you said earlier. <clears throat> and with that being said, public schools usually have a lower international student acceptance rate since their fundings rely more on the government. A really extreme example I heard is um UCSF, <clears throat> a, a great research institute, but since they are a public school, I heard that in my year, they only accepted one international student for the incoming PhD cohort. And, but for me, <clears throat> my, my cohort consists of seven international students out of seven, out of 19 total enrolled PhD students. So I guess, yes, it is statistically, it is hard to get into a PhD program as an international student because schools basically have to pay us from their private funds. So in order to be accepted, there really isn't other tips or shortcut you can take other than <clears throat> standing out from the application pool with good recommendation letters, high quality of research, research um, experience and other application materials. And for recommendation letters, most programs usually ask for three or four. And this is an important number because <clears throat> For these three um, letters, they have to be strong. And it is best if the writers know you personally and have worked with you close enough so that they can customize the letters for you. Um, as for the quality of, our quality of research experience, I'm not saying that one should aim for the hardest project in the lab. And as an undergrad, you'll probably not go far with those projects, to be honest. Instead, you'll probably just be really frustrated at the first step because those projects are really hard. What I mean by the quality of research experience is referring to the effort you put in and the insight you can gain from your work. One main quality um, PhD programs are looking for in applicants is the problem solving skills. And this skill does not just suddenly appear one day, but takes time to accumulate. 
basically the more work you have done, the more experienced you are and the more adept you are at figuring out the causes of a problem. These skill sets will give you a higher chance um, of securing an offer. And there are also many other aspects to that one should pay attention to in regards to um, the PhD applications. But I guess I'll stop here regarding the whole PhD application stuff because I think the main point today is to briefly share my journey from KS to Wake First to my institute right now. But I can definitely share those if you want me to or in the future, I don't know, or through emails. Yeah, it was a great point actually. And I think uh, the point you, you just mentioned <laughs> also really help um the students right now with their college application process oh yeah and i think one thing that you mentioned is that like it's not really about like um well it can be a bonus if you are in a really big research program but what's really important is how much effort and how much attention to detail you put into those researches because i feel like right now looking back like the depths of your essays will will reveal like how much like attention and how much you actually learn from the different researches you did or different internships experiences you have like like yeah like the exact things you did and and the process like yeah that's like um you cannot really write out a cohesive and um excellent and um detailed essay without like actually going through yes. the process I would say. yeah and i guess just one more point i'll add to that question is Another quality PhD programs are looking at is how much thinking you have put into um, the application regarding your future. So your like your plan after PhD. They don't want to admit students that just who will stop their um research or stop their work when they got a PhD degree. They want to accept students who will actually leverage that degree to do something bigger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. All right. Let's see. This question. So um this question is about um your journey in KS. So like um you only came to KS in tenth grade from a um from a um Taiwanese high junior high school in um in Tainan. Fun fact, if you guys like twice um Zi Yu like he he was in the same school with Zi Yu and see her. Yes, we're in the same year actually. Yeah, have you ever talked to her? Yeah, we're no, no, but we're in the meeting together once, and I think that's the only time. I think that's the that's one of the two times I've seen her. The other time I was at a talent show, and then she was performing on the stage. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Job <laughs> TT like. TT. <laughs> oh, she 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 hadn't joined TT yet. Oh, she hasn't. She hadn't joined twice at that time. She was just performing on stage as a typical middle school kid. Oh, did she yeah. look like really talented already back then, or just curious? Like, I think she. You can definitely think. You can definitely see that she's she was special among the other <laughs> of her classmates. Because like, I don't know her 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 like. Her choreography looks more professional. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. You can tell the difference. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Nice. Fun fact. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Back to the point. So you came okay. to 10th <laughs> grade and um, didn't speak out English, was in ELO before, and um, still managed to thrive academically. So, like, um, why do you think that you succeeded despite um, having to, um, learn English in such a um such a mature age. Mm. Yeah. Um first of all, I think the KS community is quite accepting in general, at least speaking from personal experience. Um I wouldn't say I thrive academically. I think there's a whole list of people who had a far better grades than I had. But I think what helped me survive in the in in the new environment when coming to KS in 10th grade was the people and later become friends. There are many things I wouldn't be able to do without help from friends and teachers. Um, and that's true from a college experience as well. Like looking back and grateful for having such a support and fun group of friends around me that not only helped me academically, but also just social. For, it's really easy for me to blend into that um, culture. Yeah. 
So like I kind of I couldn't have done it without you, Jeremy. Like I remember you're one of the first group of people that talked to me, and I yeah. So it was like. <laughs> I think it was moments like that that made me realize, oh, this is a safe environment for me to like do what I want to do and to express myself. Yeah. Thanks. That's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was there. But yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. But I I'm not sure if people who ask this question are looking for more like study tips or like yeah, because I I think yeah, oh. I think there's a question that's leading up to that, so it's all right. Let's get to that. Next. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So um, oh yeah, actually that's a ne exact next question. So like, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, ask like um yeah. So like, um, what are some strategies for memorizations and understanding biology concepts? Okay, great question. It's like a perfect um. <laughs> continuing from the last question i think um i think once you fall into the trap of trying to memorize something you will forget about it easily but if you try to internalize the knowledge everything becomes easier for me i have an internal interest in biology so biology and science in general actually so when i'm reading a biology text or any like science text i will try to relate that to actual scenario in vivo like inside a animal body uh, for example, when learning about photosynthesis in high school, I would have a story in my head with, in which I picture how these molecules interact with one another. In college, when learning about immunology, since there are a large variety of immune cells, cytokines, different immunoglobulins, you know, so many different molecular mechanisms. If you try to memorize them term by term, definition by definition, you're going to, you're not going to retain all, in, all that information especially in doing an exam setting. So my strategy for that was to drop everything out on paper when I was studying by myself or on a whiteboard when I was in a group study session with some of my friends and classmates. Mm -hmm. Because I know I'm more of a visual learner. So drawing complicated pathways out actually helps me internalize the vast amount of knowledge more efficiently. And um, sorry, I didn't do that for a study guide um, we had back then because it was on Google Docs. It's really hard to um draw things on Google Docs. So I just tried to like instead um when doing making the study guide back in high school, I just tried to like um bullet point everything and try to make it as coherent as possible so that when people read it, it can be like a story. The flow will be better, it will be easier for them to memorize like step by step what's going on through a mechanism. Mm -hmm. But um, back to my mapping strategy, I think another benefit of it is, especially for genetics, is that you are going to run into something else that interacts with your prior knowledge. And that's the time you should take out your map, either physically or mentally, and incorporate the new info information to your old map. So now you have a more complete map, a more complete understanding of the subject matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like you mentioned, like um, drawing it, it out. Like um, after you draw, do you draw out like, do you draw the same information many times, or do you just draw it out once and then just read it and look at the picture? Because like sometimes when we memorize stuff, we got memorize over and over again. Oh, so usually my first draft looks pretty crappy. Like it's really unorganized because the first the first. My first draft will basically just be me reading the text and trying to draw out the text like line by line. And that's not coherent because later on you will find like different paragraphs actually connect to like, sorry. Um, sometimes the paragraphs that, wait, sorry, let me back try a little bit. Sometimes when authors um write the write the text, they're more for the um the ling linguistic flow. But when you're trying to animate the story from a text, it's kind of difficult to do it line by line. So what I did is that first I'll draw out everything line by line, have to do it, and then I will try to synthesize new mental maps or new um, schematics from the initial drafts. 
So from the initial draft, I'll take out elements and then kind of reassemble them to make it a more um, visually pleasing and cleaner version of the pathway described in the paragraph. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you actually, it's actually really like, like drawing out for first time, it's a little messy, not sure what concepts are, are connected to what other concepts. Yeah. As you like learn more about it, you make it into a complete version. And by the time you finish the yeah. final, you already practice so many times, you already ingrained it in your brain. Yeah. Yeah. So it actually, well, doing the process of dissecting the paragraphs and breaking it apart mm -hmm. will actually help you memorize. So just internalize the knowledge because in order to dissect the paragraphs out, you actually have to read the text and then really actually understand what the um, author is trying to convey. And then after like you are able to synthesize your own version of the um of the concept. Yeah, amazing. That's a great answer. Takes time, but it works. No yeah. sure about <laughs> listening to this, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um um next question. Um do you need a great college for a research like so you are in a PhD program right now. Do you feel like um, you need to be in a prestigious college to get into a PhD program for like researchers or like in the science field? I guess the, um, the great colleges this question is referring to are probably the, like the top 10s and the IVs. And if that is true, if my assumption is true, then my answer is no. Many people, as is, is a no, many people in my cohort are not from the Ivies. They went, we went to good schools, like I think at least the top 50s, if you look at the US news ranking. And yeah, one may say like top 50s is still within the definition of grade or high standard. And I don't disagree, disagree with you on that. But if the question is only looking for a research or pre-med related job, then going to which college, other than um, the highly precision, doesn't really matter because a bachelor degree in natural sciences, at least in the US, doesn't really matter um, in, in my opinion. Mm. People usually go on and get an advanced degree such as a master, MPH, PA, PT, PhD, MDs. So what I'm getting at is, if you're going to dabble in this field, your bachelor degree is likely, is likely not your final degree. And your final degree matters more. It is more important. And <clears throat> I know some people will go to a lower ranking school for college to be on top of their class. So when applying for med school or grad school, their profile can look amazing from their college. Mm -hmm. And so there's that for natural science majors, our college is really just a start. You should plan for what comes after college. Like the, so like for the research field, like what's really important is the, um, not even Final degree, yeah. not even the mm -hmm. school but like um the program that you are like the the prestigiousness and the advancement of the program that phd program that specific phd program that you're in i guess yeah i guess so and then i think if you're going to dabble in further in the research field publication actually matters more yeah oh, i see publications yeah. mm -hmm. awesome that basically reflects the work you did in your PhD. Hmm. Makes sense. All right. So um so for the fine final few questions. So um the final one is um so this is the first final questions. First of the final questions. Um let's okay. <laughs> of um so you graduated high school uh, and you went yeah. to college. And um, so from graduating high school to being a PhD student in Yale, like what are some of the significant events that happened in between? So for example, like we had Audi, Audi for last in, for the last um interview, right? So Audi gave like so she, he he graduated from KS, went to UCLA for computer science, and the first internship was in Taiwan, and the second internship he got was at Amazon. Then he got a job basically at Amazon. So. Can you give me like kind of like a similar broad history of from graduating from KS to um Yao? Yes. Um. So yeah, I think it's basically a college timeline. 
So in my freshman year, first semester, I attended the research info session at Wake, in which the lab PIs or PhD students will showcase their research and see if any undergrad would be interested in joining their labs. Then in the following spring, I emailed one of the professors regarding my interest in her lab. And that's how I got into that my undergrad research lab. Mm -hmm. In the same semester, I also applied for a summer internship. So then I'm able to, I was able to work at Academia Seneca Zhongyan Yuan that summer. And then following during the first semester of my sophomore year, I attended lab, I started attending lab meetings. And it was not until second semester of my sophomore year when I started doing lab works. For my sophomore year summer, I got a research fellowship, which allowed me to work in a lab over a summer. And junior year is still just all lab work every day. But then COVID happened in the spring of junior year. I didn't go back to Taiwan, but stayed with my friends in North Carolina. I was actually thinking about going back to Taiwan during that time, um, during um, that summer. So I also applied for a summer research fellowship at the National um, Health Research Institute, Guo Wei Yuan, and I got the fellowship. However, due to the strict border regulations during the pandemic period, I did not want to risk not being able to come back to the States in the fall for my senior year. So um, sadly, I turned down the offer from Guo Wei Yuan. Instead, I stayed in um, North Carolina and got another summer research fellowship here. And during that summer, I also started looking at PhD programs. And to be honest, it, that was a bit late for planning. If you're going to apply for PhD, I would strongly suggest that if you're going to apply for PhD programs, definitely start looking at different programs in your junior year spring and begin to write a personal statement and research statement in the summer or spring of a junior year. So you have more time to revise them. And although I started looking at schools in August, I didn't actually start preparing my application um, like two months away from a deadline. And that was a really, really bad example. Don't be like me, start preparing those materials as early as you can. The deadline for most PhD um, programs um, in the States is December 1st. And throughout December to early January in the following year is the time the schools will send out interview invites and so the first semester of my senior year was just preparing PhD applications. And the second semester was occupied by interviews. And thank God those like, interviews were like all virtual due to COVID. Otherwise, I won't be able to attend any of my classes because I had like two interviews per week and it was really exhausting. And while having those interviews, I also had to write my senior thesis. And after the interviews were all finished, I had to prepare for my thesis defense. Then I graduated from Wake. Um, I think throughout this journey, I got uh, a lot of help from a lot of people in my lab and just in the department in general. Yeah. Um, so um, I should have taken their advice, like start preparing um, the PhD application in the summer or spring of my junior year, which everyone, everyone should. Yes. That's how, like, when I talked to Ali last time, like, we also talked about how... Like we were talking about college essays and when we were writing in high school, but we like we both agree that if we start, although it's like really short, like two hundred fifty words, <laughs> like if you start in your junior year of high school, like you can actually plan out plan out a, a lot of stories because everybody got a story, and and like the longer you take, the the more time you have to add the story to make a story really cohesive and have it and make make it sound interesting and kind of like a movie you know like when you watch a good movie it's it got yeah good. like slowly you can add more layers to your stories and some reflection probably but yeah i wish yeah. i could have started earlier <laughs> but Good advice yeah um okay so we got four more minutes let's let's we got probably 10 more minutes of um interview so let's jump into another call uh, okay so okay so this is a month later and we missed the last 10 minutes of the interview last time so we had to record it again so my hair is a little longer but anyways let's get back into it so um so jason um what is your plan after your genetics um phd degree um so honestly, this is something also I'm exploring right now. At this moment, I'm 
leaning toward industry jobs rather than like studying studying academia after being in school for so long. And I'm actually quite open to any industry jobs from research scientists um doing wild lab stuff, QC product development, or doing consulting for biotechs um, or pharmaceutical companies. I think I'll still stick with something science related. There are some career talks or info sessions hosted by a career office here at Yale. And also I'm in a consulting club. So I'm also taking some pro bono project right now. So um, I think I'm just like exploring those different trajectories right now to see what I like the most. And there's also a mentorship program here in which I can be paired up with a Yale alumni for career advice. I think I'm going to partake that as well. So yeah, that's kind of my plan. Is there any like mm -hmm. any specific position that you are like interested in so far? I know you talked about being a consultant or being a a a researcher in the in, in the bio field in the science field. Like, do you feel like you lean toward uh, one particular position so far compared to other positions? I think right now probably uh, like 60% to a consultant and then 40% to a, like a research scientist. But um, I'm still like really new to a consulting field. So I'm really trying now to see how much I like it and um, how much I can do with my degree in the in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, why do you like why do you lean to work consulting more so far? Is it because <laughs> it's more like like more um exciting or like I think there are many factors that play into that decision. Um the first first of all, I just it's their lifestyle. I think it's really cool that you get to travel. <laughs> I mean, for some companies you do get to travel quite often and then the company will pay for your um flight and accommodations. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, another aspect is that they work on many different projects and those projects are pretty short term and you can you can have a result really fast. Um, the results being like a final presentation to the client. Um, but whether the client take that um, recommendation to their implementation, it's another thing. Uh, that's now you can what you can control. But it just, I think it's really cool that you got to expose to many different aspects of the society through working on different projects with different clients. I definitely agree yeah. with that because I'm working as a Salesforce um, mm -hmm. consultant right now. So my job is to um, build data structures, customer data structures for different types of companies. And like, mm -hmm. um, I get to work with many different companies that have many different services. So one of the examples, I work for a, a, a an airline company so i get to see all the data oh. they have to look at have to process through in their airlines like um different travel agencies they work with um the type of seats like maybe some people are flying first class and the type of services they get and and all that different information and another company i work for is um is um air pair purifier so like so like they sell air purifiers but at the same time they need like air purifier consultant to go to the place and help them set up all the stuff. So it just really being a consultant, like um, and you, you have a special, you have a specialty, but at the same time, you get to see what different companies services are. I think that's something that is really interesting for me as a consultant. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great, that's a, that's a, I think that's a great um position for a lot of people to go into. It's very exciting. Yeah. yeah, so I'm uh, just still trying out. We'll, we'll see how much I like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sounds good. So the next question is: um, We have a student um from KS, and she she has a question about her um current current activities. So her goal is going to an Ivy League school, and um, so far she has um. She has strength in mathematics and sciences in general, um, compared to language and social studies, and she wants to um attend a school that will eventually allow her to do her or him to do research and experiments, focusing more on biology and chemistry, like more in the science field, and and at the same time she wants to have he or she wants to have um, an 
uh, professors that are more engaged with their students and can have meaningful discussions and um, conversations with um, students about labs and research. So like um, um, the, this student is in a lot of clubs. Um, she's in, he or she is in Model United Nations and um, speech and debate, dance team, swimming team, and um, house of committee, co-captain, industry art club, and um, also self-studying AP biology. And um, and the question for her is that, is that she, um, the student doesn't really, um, the, is the student, the clubs the student is engaged in, is that it's not, are not all um, biology and chemistry related. And, and the student is wondering if that will hurt uh, the student's candidacy when applying for schools. And um, so what answer do you have for that? Um, so it's a good question, I guess. Um, so first of all, um, so take my answer with a grain of salt because I didn't get to go to an Ivy League school for my undergrad. And I, <laughs> I think the best candidate to answer this question might be Flora because she studied biology at UPenn for undergrad to my knowledge um so she might be a best person to ask but if she really wants to get my humble advice on this I will say um definitely do something um definitely do some research um while you're still in high school because I remember that's what Flora did when she was in Kia she was in the research lab in in Tainan, I think, and I think that kind of that have experience also, and also some of the um scientific um competitions she participated in helped her to secure offer um at UPenn. Um, also um some of the undergrads I know here they have also done research um while they're in high school, so I think if you are interested in science, I mean biology, chemistry, and you want to continue research in college you should also do some research in um in high school no matter what field but just for you to get a sense of what research is like and so that you have something to um talk about in your um personal statement or i forgot what it's called for college essays but yeah um but mm, but if you're taking you're having a lot of activities on your hand right on your hand right now um, and you find it hard to squeeze into some of those research activities, I would recommend to um rethink about what's to rethink about what's a priority for um your extracurriculum because probably some of the extracurricular are not that um like science related. I'm not saying that they're bad, but if your final goal is to go into um a science heavy school or you want to demonstrate that kind of skills on your resume when you apply to college, then you should have some related credentials when you apply. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, I believe schools, especially in the undergraduate um, institutions, institutions are highly competitive. Like, like a lot of people are applying and um, yeah, and like, Flora, like the like our classmate went got into an Ivy League school with a biology major, University of Pennsylvania. And I remember like um when, when she was in high school, she was going around doing high school um science competitions. And as a high school, she already went to different labs in Taiwan to do researches and all that to show her passion. So I guess I think um knowing exactly what you want to do is not a requirement for undergraduate institutions it's more of a requirement for master's degrees because when you're in master's you are a little older right so the schools want you to know um as specific of what you want to do in your life as possible but if you can figure that out in my opinion if you can figure that out and in, in undergraduate especially if you want to pursue in the science field like you know exactly what, what you want to go for what kind of research what field of science specifically you want to go for and you already show that um you are really interested in those fields by actually committed to um joining different researches in re relation to that and all the activities you do shows a direct path 
into the same goal, the same field that you're going to study in, then I think that would be a great, great benefit um, and will um, improve your, your admission profile to a large extent. Um, quoting the um, IB diploma, like their essay um, format, or <laughs> if you even remember that. But anyways, um, um, but at the same time, I feel like if you have time to do the things you love, like you like, if you like dancing, if you like swimming, do those things. Like, like, just make time to do something specific in your field. Um, I think I I think that would be great. But I also think that doing things you love will um will won't be like time investments because you actually like doing them so so it, mm -hmm. it definitely won't hurt but do you have the time to do a lot of stuff that re related to science outside of school is the thing i would consider mm. what would you say about that jason yeah yeah i i wasn't trying to con convey a sense that she has to do research um in high school but just as an example um doing something science related, like, um, I'm not sure if some science club is still a thing in chaos, but um, yeah, just have something that can demonstrate that you are serious about um, science in general, then I think you're in a good shape. Um, but I would say in general, applying to Ivy Leagues, for, especially for undergrads are pretty, pretty, pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. um, Many of the undergrads I've seen here have really impressive credentials um, from high school. And yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I'm also teaching a class this semester. Um, and to be honest, the course materials here are pretty, pretty hard. Like the things they're, they are learning right now as freshmen are things that are taught um, in junior or senior years in all the colleges. For freshmen. And, yeah, their freshman classes materials are what is being taught in like juniors or seniors. So like I feel like for like intro classes, you have like one on ones and like one hundred. So are those difficult classes listed as one on ones in in Yao? Or? Their 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 foundation classes are not. Um. So for example, they. So for example, in their so they have. I I know for Yao they and for biology. And they have four foundation classes you have to take in your first year. So each of those foundation classes are actually half semester. And their second foundation biology class is actually biochemistry. And <laughs> I didn't take biochemistry until my junior year of college. And I think most people didn't take it until their second semester of their um, um, sophomore. That's probably the earliest that most people take it, but they take it the second in their first semester of freshman year and in in their their third foundation class they're taking some really advanced genetics um um materials and so um yeah it's just i think the expectations are really high so i will, so that's why actually another reason why i recommend to have to do something science related in high school in addition to your regular um ib biology or chemistry classes mm. so that when you when you when you get here, you're actually you probably will not be ahead of the course, but you will be um actually on par with the level of the course material. Because mm -hmm. usually the lectures will not cover basic details. I don't know why. I actually have some issue <laughs> with that kind of curriculum design. I feel like you should still cover the basics. But anyways, um, but yeah, having some science related skills will definitely help you with them. Um, surviving or thriving hopefully um over here it's interesting to point out that it's not even the admissions when you get into the school like the academic environment is actually really really rigorous yeah they can't just expect you to know everything or can figure out everything <laughs> by yourself oh wow and so they just don't yeah this even is even the professor speaking from actual experience yeah, I kind of feel bad for the undergrads sometimes, but then the professor will always be like, oh, they are fine, they are young undergrads, they are smart enough. But uh, <laughs> to be honest, when we're TAing them, they're all the, most of the undergrads was like struggling. They're all very confused and, and very stressed out about yeah. the course. <laughs> Did but, you make study guides for them, like Mr. Roth? 
they have um they have other peer tutors who actually took course took this same course like a year before and so there are the people who are responsible for to making study guides and TAs are mainly just grading homework, grading exams, and hosting discussion sections for papers. So that's kind of our role in the class. But um, students will also ask for one-on-one -on -one assistance from TAs. Mm -hmm. And that's when they kind of, uh, <laughs> break, uh, yeah, break down <laughs> how, how they feel about the class. Yeah. yeah. I can kind of tell though, because it's um it's so it's so competitive. So once you get there, everybody are like really um academically um competent. So they really push the students really hard to succeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why having yeah, demonstrating that type of skills in high school is important so that the mission will know that you can um sort of handle those kind of stress and pressure when you come here. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we are going to, um, we are reaching the final questions of the, the final question of the interview. And um, it's a surprise question, but I already asked you, but I didn't record the last interview, but I'm gonna ask you again. And um, okay. you're gonna pretend like you are thinking about it again, but let's do it. I okay, see. so okay. Um, imagine you can go back to your, um, old high high school self self and you have 30 you have one minute to t give him any advice that you want and um what would the advice be you have one minute to answer and uh, you have one minute to think about it so i'll start the timer and just go wherever you're ready before okay one minute's up let's do it all right wow oh, time flies um i guess my Channel direction is still the same as last time, um, but I know no one heard my last response. But my my response is that I don't want to change anything. I think I believe everything happened for a reason. That might seem corny, but that's just how I believe. And I don't regret doing or not doing anything because I think everything that I've been through helps shape who I am right now. I'm not saying I'm the best right now, but. <laughs> I just, yeah, I chose every moment of what I did at KS. But if you really, really, really like want to get an answer and just to give an advice to all the KS student, any KS student right now, I will say um, I will probably do something coding related, um, just because um, I'm actually doing a computational analysis right now. And I think it will be helpful if I am exposed to that kind of thing stuff earlier, like in college or high school. And so, yeah, I'll probably take a comp site class, like either at KS or outside um, of KS. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And I guess, yeah. I guess another thing is probably I will do a research related stuff in high school, like from final lab. Not sure what level of stuff the high school students to um going, but yeah, do that. And because I honestly I didn't do any like science heavy extracurricular activity in high school, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think that's what I would do. Thanks, younger self. Awesome, we got what well, one extra minute of advice advice from. To low former high school self, so that's a bonus. Okay, so thanks, Jason, for the interview, and um, yeah. yeah, we'll see you next time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, bye.